Hi there, and welcome to the Call to Cinema. My name is Aaron, and today we're going to be reviewing the Screen Factory Blu-ray and the film itself of April Fool's Day. Uh, of all these slashers in this uh, in this genre, basically, this one has great pedigree both behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And with that being said, uh, let's dive into it. April Fool's Day by Fred Walton is one of my favorites of this entire era. And basically because it does things that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to say right now, we are going to get into spoiler territories when it comes to this film. Of course, you can see that I still have the disc in the uh, in there because it makes a great background. <laughs> but I, uh, I really want to talk about this film. There are an amazing, it's amazing to think about the people that went like, behind the scenes for this and the people that worked on this in front of the scenes. When I was a kid, uh, when I saw this film, this came out back in 1986. Uh, you have to understand that the slasher genre was extremely prevalent. It was in 1978 that Halloween came out that really kind of started a bit of the, sl the slasher, like, okay, this these indie slasher films can make money. But it was 1974 with Black Christmas that slasher films had actually gotten their start. In 1980, Friday the 13th came about and it gave pretty much the uh the blueprint for the slashers that you would see going forward including the sequels to halloween which started before it so we have this 1981 1982 period where the slasher genre is really like everything churning out is it's a slasher film where it's come some kind of like uh twist on on the slasher genre mm -hmm. this goes on out through most of the 80s uh, when 1984 comes about we get nightmare on elm street which gives a kind of a supernatural slasher but uh, that's about as different as we as we get. Most people think like, oh, well, the slasher genre was kind of killed, but it didn't really get anything big until the whole meta commentary with Scream came about. But uh, there was a slasher before that that decided, you know, we can do something a bit different. So the basic storyline for this one right here is there's a group of college friends that come together to meet up with their friend Muffy at her uh, at a house that she has just inherited and they're gonna have a weekend they're kind of they're, they're they all get along they're light they're fun they're they're playing pranks on each other the entire time but things suddenly get not so funny as ominous messages and clues going to every person's room things about dark parts of their past uh things that they may not want to see come out into uh into light so all of a sudden we're looking at a film that's had this kind of lighthearted tone to it and things start to get a bit darker and then people start to die and much like films before it like the uh and then there were none we start to uh to see that trope come out where we pretty are, are certain who the main characters that are gonna you know hopefully survive are going to be now with that being said let's talk about the actors that are in this film now we got of course uh, Deborah Foreman playing the role of uh, Muffy, the one that owns the island. Um, there are so many actors that I am. I'm just grabbing this out here. Griffin O'Neill uh, plays Skip. He's uh, he's the cousin of, of Muffy. He's uh, a young actor. Clayton Roner is uh, a very special actor when it comes to me because when I was growing up in the '80s and I was trying to figure out what my acting style or persona was going to be Clayton Roner was this kind of actor that had just this he was cool without trying to be cool and it is kind of what he did it's how it, and I really tried to emulate that not just in my acting thing but as a as a teenager trying to find my way uh, here was a guy in the film that you know he had the camera he was a movie he was kind of a movie guy he was filming everything you know he was he was doing good with the ladies I wasn't so I thought hey maybe I can emulate Clayton Romer. Uh, but there's a lot of great actors in this one here. Uh, we have Jay Baker as Harvey. He's kind of the uh, the Southern uh, guy that's definitely kind of wants to make his way in the, uh, in the in the business world. Fantastically enough, we have like a Leah Pinson in here. And there's a, 
that comes back to to my home province because of uh, the most probably the most prolific actor that ever came out of Newfoundland is an actor by the name of Gordon Pinson, which I'm sure you've all heard of uh, because he did actually was in an Academy Award uh, nominated film. And he was incredible in it. So his daughter, Leah Pinson, uh, is uh, is in this film as well. She plays the character of Nan. And uh, she's uh, a bit of a unique or darker character. Amy Steele is the lead in this one alongside of, uh, of, of Deborah Foreman. She's the one that basically plays the Amy Steele type girl next door. Nobody can play the girl next, the beautiful girl next door uh, better than Amy Steele can. Most people are going to remember her from movies like Friday the 13th part two. That's uh, you know, that's, or if you're a fan of like 80 sitcoms, you're also going to remember has the girl that took Alex's uh, virginity in family ties. Um, and that's my cat, by the way, uh, being a terror again. We have Tom Wilson here, which most of you guys are going to know has Biff from uh, Back to the Future. Uh, he was a prolific stand-up comedian. He was really good with improv. So there are a lot of the scenes in this film that are, uh, that are improv, a lot of dialogue in that. He was extremely good with that. And you can tell. Uh, I actually recommend looking on YouTube uh, after this video and looking for the song that Tom Wilson wrote about all the questions to get asked that he gets asked all the time as an actor. Most of them, of course, are about Back to the Future. So um, it's, it's hilarious. And part, I think it was part of the Just for Laughs comedy tour when he was, uh, when he was hosting it. Anyway, let's get back to the film. Uh, we got this directed by Fred Walton. Fred Walton is probably most famous before this film for another little uh, pop bottle with a bit of a twist to it called When a Stranger Calls uh, with uh, Carol Kane. One of the films that uh, gave me nightmares as a kid and uh, probably started out the urban legend film trope, the, you know, the killers inside the house. If you don't have it, I recommend Second Sight's edition of uh, When a Stranger Calls. It's uh, probably the best one out there. And you can, if you can find a way to find the limited, try and do that. We also get Charles Bernstein uh, doing the uh, music on here. And uh, honestly, I can't go into the amount of music that he's done, but the guys worked with Wes Craven on Nightmare on Elm Street. He's, he's done a ton of music for, from different genres. He's amazingly fantastic. For me, I'm a huge fan of those early Burt Reynolds uh, films, like the pre-stash Burt Reynolds. So he did the work for White Lightning and Gator. And he actually did the song uh, for, for White Lightning as well. So that is super cool. So he does not just do like score films, but he actually does sometimes like the end credit songs for films. For the longest time, when I watched April Fool's Day, he had this kind of like almost old kind of like seems like a 20s, 30s style, you know, one of those wacky kind of like flapper air songs called uh, Too Bad You're Crazy. And I thought, OK, that must be something from uh, from back in that day. It's not. It's actually a. Uh, something that he composed himself and wrote. And uh, that that blew my mind. As far as the uh, as the rest of it goes, uh, the, the the cinematographer, Charles Minsky, is, is again, another prolific cinematographer. The people and the pedigree on this film are, are incredible. This is the first film that Frank Mancuso Jr., I think it's the first film that he produced after doing the Friday 13th films. He'd been doing the Friday 13th films. He wanted to do something of his own. And uh, this came about... And it was right after uh, Fred Walton had worked on an episode of the uh, new Alfred Hitchcock Presents, uh, doing like a very creepy episode. I think it was called like the uh, the open window. It was something like the open window or something. It was like a really creepy episode. Um, but uh, because of that, he ended up getting hooking up with uh, with Frank Mancuso Jr. on April on April Fool's Day. Uh, Charles Minsky had knew, known Frank Mancuso Jr when he was working as an AP on another film. So that's how they got together. Um, you actually even have the guy, oh God, I can't remember his name right now, but that worked, it was like, a, like what's his name? Strauss, his name is Strauss, his last name is Strauss. So he worked on a, uh, a bunch of like really prolific films. And when you watch The Shining and you hear that, you know, that opening ominous theme in The Shining, he worked He worked on that with, uh, with another uh Berlacki, I think. Uh, you'll know. Put it in the comment section down below. That's what the comment sections are for. That's why you got to use these things. That and because, you know, algorithm, it helps. 
Speaking of alg uh, algorithms, before I go any farther talking about this film and the amazing special features that are on here, uh, I should say right now, uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. It really does help the channel a lot and lets you be able to see my videos. It lets me know that my videos are being seen. And when you write a comment down there, it actually uh, it helps out too because the gods of YouTube are changing and angry and weird. So there we go with that. Uh, as far as before I go into any of the other stuff, because we're going to go into spoilers soon, the features on here are all incredible. You get interviews with Fred Walton, Deborah Goodrich, Royce, Clayton Rohner, cinematographer Charles Minsky, and composer Charles Bernstein. Initially, I was a bit disappointed that there wasn't a uh, there wasn't a um, an commentary, or that they didn't w include some of the other unused footage from the other ending of the, of the film. Apparently, there may have been up to three. But uh, that being said, it is a overall fantastic package. The it looks really good. Right at the beginning of the film, there uh, there's a bit of like it looks to be a bit of kind of like damage at the right at the opening sequence um, during one scene. I thought like was that a crack in my TV or is that hair in the film? Uh, but after that, everything goes. It, it's perfect. It's uh, it's the best this film has ever looked. I've owned like DVD copies of this before. I, I think I might have had an old Blu-ray of this one uh, back in the day that uh, that definitely did not look uh, half as good as uh, as this one did. And I, I'm very glad to have this in my collection. I do. This does get a college cinema approved recommendation. And uh, let's get into the spoilers. So you know you might want to like mute me here for at least a couple minutes. April Fool's Day is different in the fact that it's a slasher, but it's really not. What April Fool's Day does, and it does it extremely well, is it sets up the genuine tropes of what a slasher is. It makes you think that all the characters are being killed. It puts you towards a certain person. You're almost at the point where if you've seen this movie and you actually do believe that you're watching a slasher film, that you're going to be like, oh my God, it is, it is too easy for me to guess the killer. The killer is just so obvious who it is. Um... And it gets into a line where, like, it's it's not Muffy, it's her twin sister Buffy, which is almost groan-inducing if that would, would have been the actual twist of the film. And some people were disappointed at the time that that wasn't the twist of the film. The twist of April Fool's Day is, it's in the title. <clears throat> it is all a joke. It's all, uh, it's, all, it's all a prank. Muffy has inherited a... Uh, this house but she has to prove that she can actually make it financially feasible so rather than making it a regular like a uh, old school like country inn she's decided to do kind of a murder mystery weekend and her friends are the are the test group for that so she sets up this murder mystery she plays it out uh she doesn't tell them until their characters have been killed off and um we get to the end of the film where basically uh, it all comes together and it is both hilarious and you you kind of expect there's going to be a double twist. And there's a reason for that because initially there was a third act of this film that's not in here, that there was a double twist. And afterwards, Muffy, basically her uh, one of the guests switches it around and does really kill her and kill people on the island. In my opinion, that would have ruined the film. That extra twist wasn't needed because it it goes to this spot in the film, which is perfectly done. Now, there's been complaints before about the fact that she uses these kind of like this, these dark like uh, things from her friend's past to uh, to like to kind of mess with them. Uh, like, for instance, there's one one girl there that she's only known for about a year. And her name is Nan. She's played by Leah Pinson, whose character has had an abortion. And she uses uh, like uh, a tape recorder playing baby noises in her room to unsettle her, and it causes a, a an argument in the uh, in the in the film. So some people have, have often said, you know, well, we've learned these kind of like darker secrets about these characters. You know, why don't we follow up like what happened, like how how do you know what 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 really happened behind the scenes? But that actuality is like. It's just meant to kind of flesh out what could have been just trope characters a little bit without really going into it. I mean, it's not something that you needed to like to have like given to you at, at the end of the film. Okay, so so this is what happened. 
it's more of a way to uh, to just move the plot along with these characters and give give them a bit more of a feel of like everybody's got a little bit of mystery, a little bit of a little bit of darkness to them. So the little bit of darkness and the light. Now with the character of Nan, there's also the thought that because there's a second kind of thing at the end where she where Nan looks to be still upset after all of this has gone on, uh, that uh, right at the end of the film, Nan comes up and like pretend slits the throat of, of Muffy and then looks at her with kind of this kind of this knowing look, uh, which kind of leads you to believe that maybe there wasn't ever a baby or an abortion. Maybe she was more in on it than we initially thought. That's kind of, I never took it that way until this time when I watched the film. But um, it makes sense. It makes sense to have Nan because initially Nan looks kind of falls back as one of the ones that isn't celebrating as much as the rest of them. Everybody in this film uh, does a fantastic job. Deborah Foreman playing Muffy and playing the fake sister. Buffy is fantastic. Griffin O'Neill is really good in the in the smart, small role of, of the cousin that's actually the actual twin, the brother. Um, yeah, Roner is, is Roner. He always does this kind of cool, kind of quiet, cool thing. And he's really, really good at it. That's the type of thing that he does. Um, Amy Steele is one of the best leading final girls that you're ever going to find in a slasher film ever. Um, Tom Wilson adds a lot of humor and a lot of levity to, to the film. So when he gets killed off, killed off early on in the film, you're kind of sad because you want to, you want more of this character. Wilson's a really good actor, and I really think he should be utilized more. I've seen him more recently in uh, Legends of Tomorrow. We played the uh, the dad, of one of the characters. But because of Back to the Future, I think he often got cast and often got thought of as like, oh, there's there's the bully character. When I think his his humor really should have been uh, utilized more, and hopefully, you know, it does get that way in the future. Uh, every one of these interviews is extensive enough to uh, leave you wanting more, but not leave you feeling like you didn't get enough. Uh, it does take the place of a commentary or, or a regular kind of like making of, and it does it extremely well. You feel that everything that you wanted to know uh, about the questions you might've you might wondered about with the film, that they've kind of been like at least touched on throughout the film and it's uh, throughout these, these features. This is a great uh, disc. And I do love this here, uh, this here cover. There was a bit of like controversy about the cover as well, which I don't get because this cover here with these kind of the, these Barbie doll type characters are uh, it's it's an important part of the film. Uh, it's literally an extremely important part of, uh, of of the of the film. So I'm gonna guess people probably forgot about it when they saw the cover. Like what what, what does that mean? What's that there for? But I uh, know it's it's actually an extremely important part of the movie overall. Cinematography is fantastic. The score is utterly amazing. I love the score of this film. I, in my head, I'm still singing the end credits theme song, which is something that, trust me, it's an earworm of a song. It will stay with you. Um, the picture is great. The sound is fantastic. The features are great. And this is a film that you not only, you know, don't just watch, don't just go online and stream this somewhere buy the disc this is really worth buying it's a film worth supporting i want to i love seeing stuff like this because it makes me realize why i started collecting films in the first place because films like april fool's day are films that i don't just want to watch it's not something that i want to see get lost on a streaming service or be able to see in like with with commercials on tubi or like uh, somewhere where, where it may or may not get cut down the road i want to see it i want to see the features i want to kind of breathe in everything that is the film and this is one of my favorites. April Fool's Day is a fantastic film. I 100% recommend it. It is cult cinema approved to the highest degree. And I really do think it is a film that belongs in your collection. My name is Aaron. Thank you so much for watching me today. And I'll see you here next time in the cult cinema.